Okay, so um, I'm going to be continuing the worm theme, uh, and I'm going to be talking about my favorite group of animals, uh, the annelids. So they might be a somewhat obscure group to paleontologists, as their, their body fossil record is kind of restricted to exceptional preservation and, and to the preservation of their hard parts in very particular groups. So during this talk, I'm going to introduce what ex uh, exactly what annelids are, talk a little bit about their diversity and their morphology, and then sort of do like a whistle-stop tour of what we think about annelid evolution and annelid phylogeny. And then finally, I'm going to talk about my own work and uh, the unique insights that we can get from annelid body fossils to think about their origins. So annelids are described in roughly 15,000 species. They're segmented invertebrates that are uh, closely related to uh, brachiopods and mollusks, so they're part of the Lophotrochozoa. And classically, they're divided into two groups. So there's the, the marine groups, the polychaetes, and the freshwater and terrestrial clitolates. And the, the clitolates are probably the group that you're more familiar with, so this is the earthworms and leeches. But there's also a, a, a huge diversity of uh, marine forms, the polychaetes, which have these uh, serially repeated abundant ketal bundles and these uh, outgrowths of the body wall called parapodia. And they have a range of, uh, of head appendages which, form a, uh, which, per <coughs> which perform a variety of function from feeding to sensing. So annelids have this segmented body plan. It's, an, it's a highly plastic body plan consisting of a pre-segmental region that forms the head, which typically in polychaetes has a pair of appendages, and then uh, a trunk consisting of many, uh, many repeated segments. And these segments can bear different types of uh, appendages, uh, which perform different functions, so things like gills, uh, their keti, so they can have thing, uh, keti which are involved in locomotion or protection, also hooked keti that anchor them inside dwelling tubes, and also sensory appendages, so like these dorsal and ventral cirri that you see on the, the right-hand side of the diagram. And also in a very particular, uh, particular clade, we have these internalized keti, uh, which are uh, helpful in, in uh, supporting the parapodia and are used in locomotion. So this, uh, this segmented, segmented body plan is highly plastic, and it's allowed them to explore a range of uh, feeding modes and ecologies. So we, have, we go from things like... Uh, homonymously segmented animals, which you, uh, you see on the left-hand side here, like this, this cat worm, named for its obvious resemblance to a cat. And then uh, in the middle we see Catopterus that has these modified appendages that it uses uh, for pumping water through its tube. And then other things which we think are closely related to annelids, which actually show very cryptic segmentation, like this, uh, this echiurin or spoon worm. So, uh, so this plastic body plan uh, has allowed them to, ex uh, to sort of explore uh, a range of, of different modes of life, so things like uh, this, uh, this ambush predator, this bobbit worm, and this probably rather unfortunate fish that's, that's next to it. Uh, and then things like uh, the Christmas tree, wor the Christmas tree worm, which is a, a, here seen on a coral. And then also more unusual things like this trumpet worm, so this infernal detritus feeder. And then really, really bizarre things, which are very, very highly second secondarily modified, like these, uh, these vestimentiferan tube worms, which have uh, completely lost their gut structures, and for a while were considered a separate phylum to annelids. Okay. And then we also have these really, really bizarre things. So this is a, a thing called Swima bombiviridis, which is a, a pelagic polychaete that has these iridescent green bombs around its head that it uses to deter predators. So given that we have this huge morphological disparity, how can we make sense of, of how, how our, uh, annelids originated and sort of like the, uh, the sequence of character evolution within annelids? <coughs> so, the, uh, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So the, uh, the classic morphological hypothesis for the evolution of this group is that you, uh, you have a grade of uh, superficially simple body taxa. So things like echiurins and clitolates forming successive outgroups to more complex bodied polychaetes. And uh, in the, the analysis of Rouse and Faucold, they named uh, uh, this head, appendage head appendageless group the Scalicida, and then this more complex bodied group the Palpata, principally named after this synapomorphy of having these paired palps on the head. But this was more or less completely overturned by the application of molecular systematics to studying annelid evolution, <laughs> where we actually find that these complex body par uh, uh, polychaetes are paraphyletic to, to these more simple body taxa, and that there's actually a trend uh, to lose all these characters when different groups become infernal. And also, with the case of the clitolates, they lose a lot of these, uh, these outgrowths of the body, like their parapodia and their head appendages, because they're mo uh, moving to a terrestrial mode of life. And this scenario is somewhat more compelling than the, uh, the sort of classical morphological hypothesis because it's uh, broadly congruent with the, the trends that we see in the fossil record. So the oldest annelid body fossils that we find are polychaetes, and then we don't see these other groups until much later in the Paleozoic. 
So Andley phylogenomics was the sort of the first time that we got a, a real sort of uh, sensible picture that made uh, that sort of fitted with a more uh, with a morphological scenario for the evolution of the group, where we have this large clade of sedentary annelids, which includes the earthworms and leeches, and then a clade of uh, of errant epibenthic polychaetes. And this sort of uh, reinforced the fact that these simple body tags are, are, are either a grade or completely polyphyletic and scattered across this tree. But these, are, these analyses are not without their problems because we actually have this grade of, uh, of, base, of sort of so-called basal polychaetes, which includes a, an exceptional um, a, a, a diversity of form. So things like, uh, like these uh, uh, obligate parasites on crinoids <laughs> called uh, mysostomids, the really bizarre catopterids, the fireworms, which share a number of synapomorphies with the other errant polychaetes, but are recovered outside that group, and then weird things like Magalona and also Sapunculans. But if we actually think about the, the, uh, the, the range of morphological variation in this group, they actually cover more or less the, uh, uh, much of the morphological diversity that we see in analogs. And if you include uh, Sapunculans, they actually encompass more or less the whole uh, the whole range of morphological disparity that we see in Lofotrochozoa. So it may be that having the, uh, that these groups are either misplaced due to some sort of systematic artifact, as is definitely the, place, uh, the, the case with mysostomids, because they have very fast rates of molecular evolution because, they, uh, because they're parasites. Uh, it might be that they're actually telling us very little about the primitive condition for annelids. And this is sort of reflected in the ancestral state reconstructions that, uh, that people have done using these molecular phylogenies. And more or less every sort of uh, external uh, character that we might look for in a fossil uh, uh, changes depending on the exact, exact relationships of these groups in the base of the tree and also on the taxon sample. So now I'm going to sort of move on to the, the unique insights that we get from annelid fossils. So typical, typical annelid fossils are the, uh, the, the recalcitrant hard parts that are sort of, which sort of punctuate the fossil record as they're acquired in different groups. So for example, here we have a King Knight's diamond eye, uh, a, a jaw apparatus uh, from the Silurian <coughs> described by Max Erickson. And uh, on, on the, the right-hand side, probably a more familiar uh, polychaete group to paleontologists, we have a circulid worm. So, but my research focuses uh, on exceptionally preserved annelid fossils. And I specifically wa uh, wanted to investigate where these animals fitted in, uh, in, phylo in, in annelid phylogeny and if they tell us anything, anything uh, about the, the acquisition of characters that lead, led to crown group annelids that we can't derive from these phylogenomic analyses alone. And, this and these fossils can include some really, really exceptional specimens. So uh, this is a, a, a fossil that we described uh, just a few months ago that my, my master's student is going to talk about in the, ne uh, in the next talk. Uh, and it preserves its muscul musculature in three dimensions. So we really do uh, get some exceptional annelid body fossils in some of these, uh, in some of these taphonomic windows. So uh, some of the material that I've been working on is the, uh, are the oldest annelid body fossils. So these are uh, annelids from Sirius Passet, which is a Burger Shale type locality from North Greenland. And this is approximately 519 million years old. So more or less 15 million years older than the Burger Shale. And these animals are preserved, uh, like the Burger Shale, as, re as, reflective, as reflective films. But we also get uh, three dimensional preservation of muscle tissue in these localities. And I have roughly 60 new specimens and, uh, in four taxa. So. Um, so this is Phragmakita. So this was originally described by uh, Simon Conway Morris and John Peel in uh, 2008. And sort of it's divergent from what we think is the, the archetypal polychaete body plan in that it lacks any appendages around the head and is actually entirely covered by bristles. And you can sort of see my broad reconstruction here where it, it sort of appears to lack this pre-segmental head region that we see in extant annelids. And so Pigasiris is the second taxon. Uh, that we have from, uh, from Sirius Passet, and it's the only known annelid taxon that has these uh, paired sensory appendages on the peak idiom, which may be an, an important apomorphy of crown annelids. And then the sort of like the more well-known uh, and the somewhat more attractive uh, Burgess Shale fossils. So this is, uh, this is Canadia spinosa from the, from the Burgess Shale, which we recently described the anterior anatomy of uh, in biology letters in October. And you can see that like a... Uh, like Phragmakita, uh, it, ha it appears to have a, a, very, a very strange head morphology in the fact that it has walking limbs in association with these paired palps, so which is very different to the, uh, the head that we see in extant annelids, where we don't actually have any walking limbs on the head. So it seems like there may be some sort of segmental component to the head in Canadia. And then Burgess Akita is much more similar to Pigasirus in that it has these laterally, uh, laterally displaced parapodia. And unlike Canadia, it doesn't have a uh, that covers its dorsal surface. 
So, I, uh, so much of my work has been focusing on, uh, on putting these fossils into some sort of uh, cladistic character matrix and sort of seeing if we can understand how they're related, how they're related to the annelid crown group and also how they're related to each other. So typically previous analyses that have looked at the phylogeny of annelid fossils have either included single taxa into the old Rouse and Foucault matrix or they've looked at, um, at individual faunas. And typically, these uh, they, they've got sort of a very weird and spurious results where the fossils like collapse major clades, or the fossils form uh, form separate clades, basically as a, as an effect of missing data. So my analysis is sort of, is the the most taxonomically inclusive analysis that's been done of annelids based on morphology, uh, as I include a range of fossil taxa of different ages, and I also include important groups which might be interesting for understanding the root position of annelids, so things like interstitial taxa, and also echiurins and clitolates, so these things which, other, which have previously been recovered as, a, as a successive outgroups to annelids. And this has also included a, a little bit of novel morphological data as well. So we've been doing a lot of CT scanning of, uh, of extant annelids to, to getting some insights into their muscle anatomy. So this is a, an example of a, a volume render of a, a thing called a scalabregmatid, or a maggot worm. So, uh, so these are, this is sort of illustrating the, the, uh, the diversity of form within the fossils that are included. So it includes the, uh, the carbonaceous compression fossils that I've been working on. But also a number of other important taxa, so things like these, uh, so this like this basket worm from Maison Creek, and these other jawed errant polychaetes from Maison Creek, uh, this py three-dimensionally pyrotized uh, fossil called Archonips, and also Kenostrichus from Herefordshire, which is truly exceptionally preserved in that it's preserved in three dimensions. So uh, when I've uh, when I've done these uh, these cladistic analyses, I found that when I've included the fossil data. Uh, the, I've recovered a, a tree which is broadly in line with what we, uh, what we see from phylogenomic analyses in that we have a uh, clade of sedentary annelids, uh, uh, which includes the echiurins, so these unsegmented annelids, and also clitolates as well. And then a clade of errant polychaetes, which includes the mysostomids and also the fireworms, which are, or, which are typically recovered in the base of the tree in phylogenomic analyses. So this is, uh, this is just uh, to show the parsimony tree, and uh, here's a, a, a Bayesian tree using the MKV model. And uh, under both these sort of optimality criteria, the pattern is more or less the same, but the, the tree is somewhat less resolved uh, using, uh, using the MKV model. So this is important because we now have a, a, a line of evidence which is independent of, the, of these molecular analyses that, that demonstrates that, that, uh, that this, this scenario in which we have uh, simple body taxa in the base of the tree is probably incorrect. And now we know, we know for sure that uh, polychaetes are paraphyletic. And therefore, we know that annelids evolved from a polychaete-like ancestor, which is in line with what we see from the fossil record. And crucially, the Cambrian taxa are recovered in the annelid stem group. And that means that they really do hold vital information for understanding primitive characters within annelids. So we have this grade of things with uh, dorsal protective keating. Uh, so things like uh, this new taxon uh, on the left-hand side here, and also Phragmakita canadia, and a new thing from Marble Canyon as well, which are rec uh, recovered as the most primitive members of the, of the annelid stem group. And the things with lat laterally projected parapodia, so this suggests that the uh, more, uh, more deeply nested within annelids, suggesting that protective bristles is a character that's lost prior to the evolution of the annelid crown group. And also, we see this unusual head morphology in these animals, which, uh, which we've suggested shows that the annelid head has a segmental origin, <laughs> and that actually the paired head appendages, which define the annelid crown group, are derived from, parapo from modified parapodia, which have lost their bristles and then become, mo and then become elaborated. <coughs> and I think the fact that we find, uh, we find these groups with these protective bristles in the base of annelids actually tells us something about uh, potentially about primitive characters in a sort of broader sense and uh, possibly for a Lophotrochozoan subclade. So, uh, so this animal here is uh, the larvae of crania, so it's a brachiopod larva that also shows these transverse rows of posteriorly, posteriorly directed keti. And we also see transverse rows in, this, uh, in a stem group mollusk. So this is Wawaxia here. And then we also see serially repeated transverse rows of protective bristles. And sort of my pet hypothesis for this is that Lophotrochozoans, or at least the clade that unites annelids, brachiopods, and mollusks, evolved from an epibenthic ancestor that has sort of this organic sclerotome of protective bristles. So, uh, so just to, to summarize, including annelid fossils informs the position of the root. Uh, the, the heads of Cambrian taxa suggest that there's a, a segmental origin for the annelid head and the protective keti are an annelid plesiomorphy lost before the crown group, the origin of the crown group, and that, they may, and that character may hold a, 
uh, may, may be important for understanding the evolution of Lofa Chokozoa. So thank you for your, your attention.